Hi, I'm Matt Carroll from the Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language at the Australian National Uni. And today I'm going to be talking about redundancy and linguistic morphology. So to understand what I mean, here's a simple sentence taken from Ye, a Yam language of Southern New Guinea. Ni nimdadane, we two are sitting. And we know that it's referring to precisely two people uh, by virtue of the morphology of the verb here, nimdadane. There are two affixes, both of which give us information about number. The prefix n says that it's a non-singular event, that is, that there is more than one person. While the suffix ane is a dual mark, it indicates that there are precisely two, right? And so if you know this language and you see this suffix ane, you know that it means there are two. Therefore, uh, the information that it's non-singular is essentially redundant information. This is what I mean when I talk about redundant morphology. And you should already immediately be able to understand why this might be a problem for any sort of adaptive theories of language change, right? Uh, we might expect that freed from the burden of having to mark number categories minimally, we might expect these prefixes here to be quickly eroded by uh, uh, effects of drift and random change. Uh, however, in fact, in these Yang languages, uh, these structures are, in fact, are, uh, are quite uh, old. So we might assume there might be some hidden cognitive benefits to these, which might be keeping these structures around. Uh, however, the psycholinguistic literature doesn't seem to be providing as much of that. This brings us to a paper by Martin Novak and colleagues modeling genetic redundancy. And they show how genetic redundancy can be stable uh, simply as a result of the evolutionary dynamics. So for instance, you've got these two genes, A and B, encoding some function. These have uh, non-functioning alleles or different functioning. Uh, and if they differ in their rates of change from um, mutating from the likelihood of mutating from the functioning allele to the non-functioning uh, version, uh, if those differ between them, uh, what we what they show is what we would expect that we end up with a population with just the more stable of the two genes. Uh, however, they further show that in instances where you have both these differential rates of change, you also have differential efficacy, so that the more stable gene uh, results in a lower fitness. Uh, we end up with stable genetic redundancy, right? Uh, with a population with both uh, genes A and B. Right? So, um, uh, to summarize, so they, they show how um, uh, how re redundancy is typically eroded by a genetic drift when we have differentiating rates of change, except in the very specific circumstance where the element with the lower rate of change uh, also has lower efficacy of encoding that function. So this strikes me as awfully similar, uh, compellingly similar to what we see in uh, the redundancy, morphological redundancy in YAM languages. So, uh, for instance, in our YAY example here, we've got two morphological formatives here, both encoding a given function, marking of number, um, encoding functions of number. Uh, however, they do this with varying efficacy, right? The suffix here is extremely precise in its communicative efficacy. Uh, it um, tells us exactly that there are two people here, whilst the prefix is a lot more wishy-washy. It says, oh, there's two or three or more. Uh, so here we have differentiating, we have two elements encoding a function with different rates of efficacy, and at least uh, impressionistically, uh, what looks like also differentiating rates of change, right? Surely. So uh, what I propose, uh, what I've done then is I went through uh, the YAM languages and uh, measured uh, cases of morphological redundancy uh, for efficacy and rates of change to see if we can see any uh, empirical correlates in the linguistic system uh, to support the uh, 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 observation taken from genetic redundancy. So a little bit about the YAM languages. These are a family of about 25 languages from the southern New Guinea region. Um, uh, uh, I've worked extensively on the languages on the Indonesian side of the border. Uh, these are quite small scale languages, a couple of smallest from a couple of hundred speakers to the largest of a couple of thousand, high levels of egalitarian multilingualism. Uh, and these languages are just fantastic. They have extremely rich inflectional morphology of the verbs. Uh, specifically, from now on, we're only going to be talking about tense aspect and mood categories. Uh, and Golombal, for instance, the one I know the best, has 16 uh, distinct TAM categories, and they're known for their multiple and distributed uh, exponents. Right? In other words, the types of redundant structures that we exactly the type that we're interested in here today. And so what I did is I took a verb from five of these languages, 
four of the ones for which we have good grammatical descriptions of the morphology and another language that I've been doing field work on. Um, and um, taken uh, one verb that's sort of the uh, representative of uh, the productive uh, inflectional class, right? Sort of the default verb uh, to represent sort of the most productive part of the system. Uh, and fortunately, each of these languages, uh, they uh, represent uh, uh, um, each of the primary sort of groups. There's one from each of the major groups of the tree. Uh, you can see here we've got, you know, all of the major branches covered. Uh, and I said there's five languages. There's about 25 languages. So it's a pretty good sample of about 20% family uh, with good spread for genetic diversity. Um, uh, we're only looking at tense aspect and mood here. Um, uh, so we're, I've taken just the third person singular acting on third person singular. So he hits him forms um, uh, encoded here, uh, broken up into their individual morphological components and indicated with the tense aspect and mood categories for which they occur. Uh, so I've controlled for all the other grammatical uh, variables. Uh, and then I've pulled out all the cases where the distribution of one formative predicts uh, the occurrence of another. So for instance, this R here, when R occurs, S always occurs. Right? That is, it's morphologically redundant in the context of the R and in the context of the R1. In other words, if you're a speaker of this language, all you really need to hear is the R. If you hear the R, it doesn't matter whether or not you heard the S because you can recover it. Right? And so it's uh, 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 so we might assume that any accidental mispronunciations of the S are far more likely to be uh, understood and therefore far more likely to be replicated and reproduced in the population and therefore much more susceptible to drift uh, than um, than other affixes. Right? And that's really what we're getting at. This is why we think that these shouldn't be hanging around. But uh, these languages really go nuts for it. But what I, I did is I went through and for all of the... Uh, morphological formatives from the tense aspect and mood paradigms from these five languages. I measured them for efficacy and tried to uh, come up with a measurement for the rates of change. Uh, this is really the hardest part, right? Efficacy uh, is perhaps a bit more straightforward. Um, we're talking here about communicative efficacy. That is the ability to precisely communicate uh, information to the hearer. Uh, and so we can, I think, rather naturally capture this with the information theoretic notion of entropy. So the higher the entropy, uh, the more uncertainty there is about what the value is, and so therefore the less informative it is, or the less, and which we assume corresponds to uh, effectiveness or efficacy. Um, rates of change. These are a lot harder to get at, given uh, we don't have very clear reconstructions yet of the um, inflectional morphology of the proto-languages uh, of the family. However, that's work that is currently on the way. Um, but in order to get this, what I did is I took each of the formatives uh, and then based on the existing uh, comparative work we've been doing, identified the cognate forms in each language. Um, and I uh, 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 mapped out the function of each in a three-dimensional space for tense aspect and mood. So I'm going to just exemplify this with a two-dimensional space because it's much easier. So, uh, for instance, uh, here is the functional space of the ungoable prefix S, right? Uh, ungoable makes five time distinctions between uh, various types of past, present, and future. Um, it makes, yeah, so that space is divided into five clear spots. If a language only made four time distinctions, then it would take, divide the same space across uh, four periods uh, with the uh, distributions relevant to the particular semantic categories involved. Um, uh, and similarly for boundedness uh, and for mood, which is not represented here. Uh, and then what I did is I took, calculated the geometric center, right, the centroid, right, the center of mass of this particular uh, irregular shape, and sort of be able to, so we can use this point as representing the sort of average function of this particular affix, right? So this average function of S is somewhere in this two-dimensional space here of time and boundedness. So it's more towards the future and more towards the bounded uh, edge of this space. Uh, and then I did this for all of the forms uh, 
that we have in each of the languages, uh, and then took the mean for each set of cognates, right? So here are the three cognate forms, uh, their mean position along the x and y here, uh, represented by the red dot, and then we simply measure the distance where each of them is in relationship to this. So we assume that this yellow dot being furthest from the mean uh, uh, has undergone the most amount of change compared to the other two, right? The green second and then the blue considerably less change. Uh, as a way of estimating how much functional change um, uh, affix has gone through over time. Uh, and then we can use that to create uh, a velocity, a rate of change, by taking uh, the distance um, um, over the branch, branch length. Uh, so let's quickly now go to the results. Um, so our prediction is that formatives in morphological redundant situations should have the ones that have the lowest entropy should also have the right, highest rate of change. Uh, and for 33, this is so remarkable, for 33 pairs of subset distributions, there are only two exceptions in, um, uh, in the data that we have. So the way to read this here, we have this um, in the bottom left corner here, SR OMO. We see for each one of these formatives, the entropy decreases, right? That is the information they provide increases uh, and correspondingly uh, the velocity, the rate of change, how much they've changed over time uh, also increases. So this uh, seems to provide wonderful confirmation of, um, uh, of our prediction. Um, there are two exceptions, I'll talk about them briefly. Uh, one of them I don't really think is an exception, uh, it involves this en suffix uh, which has no cognates in the data set, so we might assume that this is a recent innovation. Uh, and as a recent innovation, uh, according to our measure, it has a zero rate of change, right? It's only, it was, it hasn't changed since it was uh, innovated, uh, since it was created. Um, uh, however, given that it's so recent, it probably isn't as stable as we might, as the measure is potentially saying. Uh, although, and then beyond that, there was one true exception that I can't seem to explain with the data, right? But I mean, I think this is really, uh, uh, a uh, really uh, surprising amount of confirmation uh, of our observation, of our prediction. Uh, this actually, I was worried, this seemed to be too good to be true in some ways, right? How could it be that all of them, almost all, except for maybe one example, were not con were conforming to our observation? Uh, I thought potentially this could be a result of the types of measures that we were using, right? Um, uh, however, that doesn't really seem to be the case. If you take uh, all the... For, Every formative, not just those in uh, redundancy relations, and we take we uh, take a correlation, do a regression of entropy versus velocity. We see only a weak negative correlation, right? If uh, this was a result of the way we were, we were measuring, we would expect to see a much stronger correlation here. Instead, we just see a 0.28, which is a fairly weak correlation, uh, which is sort of not really statistically significant, um, and that's exactly what we might expect if uh, given our hypothesis here, right, that that there is some relationship between uh, redundancy and um, uh, rates of or efficacy and rates of change in the, in the process of maintaining morphological complexity. Um, but um, uh, but the fact that it's not a stronger correlation shows that it's, well, this is not something that's just coming out because of the measure. Uh, I also had a chance to go over this for the Kardvelian languages, which are a very different sort of language family, and I don't have the time to discuss them in my talk, uh, but I've kept them in the slides if anyone would like to look at those. Um, uh, and so finally, I would just like to say, I think, um, to give a quick summary, where uh, we've seen how we might expect redundant structure in morphology to erode over time through forces of drift. Uh, we saw one possible explanation coming from modeling and genetic redundancy, and that's this paper by Novak, and they showed that evolutionary uh, redundancy can be evolutionary stable if the less efficacious gene of the redundant pair also is more stable than itself, that is, it has a lower rate of change. We then checked uh, in two uh, unrelated language families, and we saw that almost all cases of morphological redundancy, the formative with the higher entropy also shows the lowest distance from the functional mean of its cognate forms, right? and we're taking this to mean that it has uh, um, 
um, um, lower rate.